Okay, thank you. So let's continue. So yesterday I am already rather behind time, so <laughs> I will try to speed up and catch up. So I have, uh, yeah, about the notes, I have been updating still, and I asked uh, to upload it, but it may take some time. But in the meanwhile, I still work on section one. So section one is already uploaded, right? So you can take a look. There are some update, but uh, yeah, basically the same as before. So yeah, yesterday, I started from kind of general introduction, but then we are now focusing on the TASIP, in which particles hop only in one direction. And we also specified the initial condition to be very, very simple one. So step initial condition like this. All sites on the left are occupied. All sites on the right are empty. And we just count the number of particles which crossed uh, the place here between site site zero and one. And we denote this integrated current by n of d. And we consider the, the distribution function of this quantity n of d. And uh, we want to find the formula in this way. And uh, as, as you know, as you see, so this part looks very much like a GUE expression. So once we have this formula, then we can apply the standard techniques of random matrix theory to study uh, large time behavior and to get tra GUE trace rhythm distribution, which is expected to be universal, right? So this is a basic story. And now we want to derive this formula. And uh, then uh, now, for general ASAP, we are considering uh, transition probability, which is denoted as GX of GX and T. <clears throat> Maybe, yeah, we could put some subscript N. So we are considering N particle sector, and we are considering transition probability. And the time evolution, evolution equation can be written in a way like this, as a linear equation. And where L star is uh, related to the generator of the Markov process, and uh, this can be represented as a matrix. So, but instead of considering real this uh, time dependent, uh, this um, differential equation, instead we are now considering an uh, eigenvalue problem for this generator L star. So we, are, we want to find some function or eigenvector psi, which satisfies this kind of relation. And lambda is the eigenvalue. And because we are considering n particle sector, we can consider n equal one, two, three, and so on, right? And yesterday we considered n equal one case. Uh, yeah, and uh, to construct such eigenfunction, the basic technique is to use this famous beta ansatz, in which we assume that the eigenfunction takes this type of particular form. And uh, of course, uh, there's no guarantee that uh, this gives us the correct eigenfunction, but uh, at least for, the, for several special models, including this ASIP, then this, is, uh, this gives us the, co the correct eigenfunction. And this is what we are trying to find now. For, for the case of n equal one, this is just a kind of Fourier mode, and uh, from this one can determine the eigenvalue to be over. And this is And uh, yesterday we also did the calculation for n equal two. And in which case, uh, lambda. So now we have two variables, z1 and z2. So eigenvalue is just a sum of two. And then the kind of no, most non trivial part comes for the ratio for the coefficient here. Now we are considering n equal two, so there are only two terms, right? Then we want to determine the coefficients. Only the ratio is important. And so this was determined by considering the this eigenvalue problem, especially boundary behavior when two particles are across our neighboring sites. Then this was determined 
will be of of this form. Yeah. So in a sense, yeah. So in the case of two particles, we have only two terms. And in a sense, this is a superposition of two cases depending on the order of x1, first and second particle. And uh, these coefficients gives us some kind of balance between two regions. And uh, in, in a sense, in, in such a sense, this, is, this ratio is sometimes called two-particle scattering matrix. This is coming from scattering theory from quantum mechanics, but uh, yeah, this is just a word. Now, what about the general n case? Maybe first, what about n equal 3k, right? Then we can write down the beta and that wave function just by considering n equal 3k. So we are considering three permutations. So there are six terms now, six coefficients, a, one, two, three, one, three, two, and so on, right? <clears throat> we want to determine them, at least, uh, yeah, uh, modulo some factor, uh, constant factor like a one two. Then, of course, uh, we first first thing uh, is to determine the eigenvalue. This is easy. Then we get uh, just a sum of three terms like this, plus epsilon z three. Then we want to determine these coefficients by using the boundary conditions from this eigenvalue problem. Then, basically, we have very, very similar situations for n equal two case, because uh, we are considering three particle case. In general, they are far away, but uh, sometimes we should, two particles come very close. But in this case, we get uh, same, basically the same condition as for two particle at the x1 and the x1 plus one, right? So this gives us this ratio. We could also consider this, this situation. And in this case also, we get a very similar uh, ratio, x2 and x3. So th this will, they will determine basically all of the coefficients, except the uh, constant factor. <coughs> uh, but then, one question here is that what happens when three particles come on all neighboring sides? If this situation gives us extra condition, then it means that uh, this beta and that does not work, is not working. But uh, fortunately, for the case of ACIF, we can check that the condition coming from this particular case is actually a kind of linear combination of this case and this case. So there, there is no new condition, which means that uh, <coughs> so this beta, beta and that wave function works well. So if we determine the ratio by using this two-particle scattering matrix, then we can actually construct the eigenfunction function in this beta and that form. Yeah, so, so when you have some problem at your hand and try to apply this kind of integrable system techniques, first thing you can try is to make the ansatz, beta ansatz, and then try to apply that. Then try to see, so n equal one is, should be easy. N equal two cases also basically easy. You, usually if you switch to kind of center of mass and relative coordinate, this becomes one particle problem. So basically you can solve two, n equal two case. The high, high, highest, highly non-trivial part is n equal three case. Here you should check that uh, if there's no inconsistency appearing for the first time for n equal three. Uh, if this works, this is a very, very strong indication that uh, your model at hand is actually integrable, and you can study various properties by using beta. Right? Anyway, in this way, one can construct the uh, eigenfunction for ACEP for general n. And uh, for general n, so A sigma, by combination of these two particle scattering matrix, one can write down some formula for a sigma, this coefficient, explicitly. Yeah. 
in this form. So one can check that uh, with this coefficient, this is the correct eigenfunction for a Yes, yeah, so may maybe we could put a trivial coefficient, but uh, this is not very really important, so I'm omitting it here. Uh, the, yeah, corresponding eigenvalue is just a sum. Thank you. <clears throat> right. So now we have eigenfunction. But uh, how? Can, but what we really want to have is some formula for transition probability. How can we write write it down? Of course, it should be written as a kind of a superposition of eigenfunction, right? But we haven't specified what kind of values these ZJ can take. So, so this is kind of related to the problem of completeness of the beta state, beta under state, which is constructed in this form. And usually this is a very, very difficult problem. And uh, there, are, there are many, many works on such difficult problems. But uh, <clears throat> in the case of ACEF, we don't actually really have to worry about it because uh, once we have this formula for eigenfunction, we can try to write down some formula for the transition probability itself, and then just check that it satisfies the conditions it should satisfy, namely uh, the master equation and the initial condition. If some formula satisfies these two conditions, uh, it should be the correct uh, transition probability. So we don't really have to worry about it. It contains some information about completeness of in fact, uh, it means that uh, basically, I beta, I beta and that wave function written in this way with appropriate values of z should be complete, right? Otherwise, uh, we, we cannot get the correct transition probability. But anyway, by, once we have some formu formula for eigenfunction, we can try to write down transition probability for the case of A set. And this, was, this is not so difficult, in fact. And, uh, Oh, sorry, we thought this is um, just coefficient, right? Now, if we put it here, we can write down the formula for eigenfunction. So this is a sigma. Then the transition probability. It's written as a contour integral of this wave function. this way, right? So, so this part is, is beta and that's wave function itself. And now we kind of consider a superposition of these eigenfunctions, sum of eigenfunctions. So, yeah, again, so, so this, is, this, is, this part is eigenvalue lambda. So basically, this part times this part should give us uh, should be a, a solution for this. And now we consider a superposition of these states so that it satisfies the uh, initial condition. Then, uh, first we have to put this factor here to satisfy the initial condition. So basically, we, for, for checking the initial condition, we put t equals zero, right? So then this factor disappears, then we consider some integral, oh, sorry, so this should be, okay. Then if we forget about this, basically this gives us, so if this is about, for example, uh, origin, basically this gives us delta function for each x, right? But uh, of course we have to check that uh, other terms should vanish after taking appropriate sum. But then, of course, we have to specify this contour integral. And then, for, for our case of ACIP, it turns out that uh, 
these controls can be taken to be very, very small control around the origin so that uh, it does not include any poles which are included in this coefficient. So this, the, in, the, in, the, in the denominator, there are many poles here, but we have to take controls such that uh, they do not, the controls do not include any pole coming from this scattering map. If we take these controls in that way, then we, one can check that, uh, in fact, this at fn t equals zero, this gives us a product of delta function. So this becomes, okay, right? so this is the correct initial condition. That's right, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. What kind of uh, values of z are taken is kind of reflected in these contours. Right? Usually for quantum mechanics, uh, formal. Yes, yes, that's true. But usually for quantum mechanics, for self adjoint operators, of course, uh, we know that the uh, eigenvalue should be real and, uh, yeah, and uh, Correspondingly, this can be taken to be some special form. But for the case of ACE, we, we have to use contour integrals. And uh, if one can check that, uh, well, in principle, one can kind of expand it into more real expression. But uh, this is more convenient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, well, uh, in this way, we can construct, we can give some explicit formula for the transition probability for general ACE. Because we have some formula for general ASIF, maybe we can actually study general ASIF starting from, for example, from the safe initial condition. But uh, this formula is not so useful for such kind of purpose because there is still a very heavy summation of uh, all permutations. And uh, it is very, uh, usually it is very, very difficult to perform this sum. So for general ASIF, the analysis is very, very difficult. But uh, later, <coughs> Tracy and Rhythm actually started from this formula and studied long time behavior to see, for example, trace rhythm distribution, but this came much, much later. But first we focus on the TASIF case. What is the speciality of the TASIF for this? So, so in the case of TASIF, now we are putting P plus Q equal one. So for the case of TASIF, we set P equal one and Q equal zero. In this case, so this simplifies a lot, this wave function, because uh, for the case q equals zero, so this, this part disappears, right? And this becomes just one. So this is just a product of factor of one minus z sigma j divided by one minus z j. So this is much simpler than for general ASIP case. And in fact, you see the determinant now, right, for, this, for the TASEP limit, because uh, this is now written in terms of xj and sig sigma j in all places. And we have summation of our permutation. So this fits really to the definition, the usual definition of the determinant. So, which means that uh, for the, in the limit of TASIF, this can be written as uh, some determinant. Okay. So now, what about the transition probability? Of course, we can put this determinant uh, eigenfunction here, right? Then they are now factorized in the determinant. So we can take this n-fold integral inside the determinant. Oh, that's strange. Yeah, here there should, there should, there should have been sign. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, thank you. So then this is the determinant of this, yeah. And then,
Then the transition prob probability itself can be written as a single determinant. this form, and uh, after a slight change of variable, where the function appearing as matrix element for this determinant transition probability can be written in this way. Here, zero one means that uh, we take only poles at uh, zero and one. Yeah. Maybe I use the same kind of notation afterwards as well. Hmm? Imaginary time. So this is T. Oh, no, no, so this is semicolon, sorry. So this formula was first found by Schutz a long time ago. And uh, so this is the way one can kind of construct some expression for the transition probability. But of course, uh, we have not been completely sure about uh, this integral, whether this really gives the uh, initial condition, right? So once we have this formula, one can again check that uh, if this really satisfies the conditions, it should satisfy mass equation, the initial condition again. And uh, for TASIF, we can again start start from this expression and the this. And uh, this is also written a little bit in the notes, so you can see what kind of things you should do for checking. Yeah. Anyway, so this is the formula for transition probability for TASE, right? And after that, we use this to arrive at this formula. But before going to, do, to, go, going to that, let me mention a little bit about the beta ansatz, one remark, the beta ansatz. So he, in this lecture, we mainly focus on the system on Z, A step on Z. So, but uh, in many cases, especially for the you kind of usual context of beta ansatz, which is applied to quantum mechanical system, people often study the models on finite ring with L sites, and usually with periodic boundary conditions. In this case, there is a kind of extra gradient in the beta ansatz. So, so even for n equal one case, we, we said that uh, psi x, so this Fourier mode is basically the eigenfunction, but uh, this is true for the system on Z, but if we put a, put a particle on a ring, of course it should satisfy the periodic boundary condition. So there are some conditions that uh, z to the power L should be equal to one, right? Of course this becomes just a kind of Fourier finite uh, expansion, right? <coughs> but what about n particle case? Then, it finite, uh, sorry, for oh, remark. Uh, <laughs> sites. Then we should put some boundary condition, and it gives us some conditions on the value of ci, which can be written in the way, in the way from the periodic boundary condition for a system with a system size L on a ring, then we, we see that uh, these values of ZIs should satisfy certain conditions written here. And this is called the beta and that equation. And in fact, many works on integrable systems especially for physics applications to quantum spin chains and so on, many works have been devoted to the study of 
numerical studies of this equation right, to extract physically important information. But uh, as I said already, for our purpose for studying A step on Z, so this extra difficulty does not appear. So we can simply work with this kind of expression. Right? But uh, if we want to study system on Z, we have to consider this kind of conditions as well. Yeah. No. no. Yeah. One can just try to take the appropriate kind of, yeah, superpositions, which should give us the correct transition probability and so on. Yeah, so the issue of completeness is much, much simpler for system on Z. Right, I know. Yeah, next, by using this formula, so now we come back to the k case, for which we have now determinant formula for transition probability, and we want to derive this formula. Right? The general idea is very simple. Because the expression over there is related to related to Charlie polynomial, as I mentioned already yesterday. Uh, yeah, the title here is the Charlie ensemble represent formula. The basic idea is very simple. So first, we we write this probability by using transition probability. How can we do that? It is useful to consider space of picture. So we are considering step initial conditions in which all the particles start from the left hand side. And we, um, yeah, we, we count the number of particles which crossed this line at the uh, position between size zero and one, right? So maybe it looks like this. So we want to count the number of these points, basically. But uh, so now we have some information about the transition prob probability, which is at uh, fixed time t. But it is rather easy to see that uh, if we have the information about transition prob probability, we can consider the number of points here, which is the current, by considering the situation on the right-hand side here. So. The formula so now we are putting the labeling like this so the probability that the, the, the current integrated current time t is bigger than bigger than y equal to n is actually really the same as the probability that the nth particle which I, which we now denote as x1 or any particle system is at positions at one or to the right. right? And then this can be written as a sum, big sum over x1 blah blah xn with this condition, with this condition coming from here of the transition probability. And now we have but a compact determinant of formula for all this G, which is written down here, so we can try to use that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one can do this, post, this calculation for general N, but uh, here, let's consider only the case of N equal to two. In this case, so let, let me first write down the starting formula first. If we really write down the formula, uh, this with this expression for n equal to two case, it's like this. It's given as this. Now, so I just I want to give you some um, 
flavor of the calculation we, we have to do to arrive at that formula. But first, we have to rewrite this function a little bit. So this function, this has nice structure, right? This, this satisfies nice recursion, recursion relation and so on. So, so for example, this f1 can be written, maybe I do this one more step. In fact, f1 function can be written as the infinite sum of f0, like this. So f1 is just sum of f0. So this can be checked by using the definition of fn. And the same thing for f, f0. So this can be written as a sum of f minus 1. Now we have this formula with extra sum. But the good, good thing about this new formula is that uh, now we have you know, the same function at, this, at the each, uh, each row. So let's call this maybe x1, y2. Then, so maybe first we can rewrite this sum a little bit. Expl explicitly, x1 from 1 to infinity, x2 from x1 plus 1 to infinity. So there was order, but uh, now I, I make it more explicit, right? Then, maybe we can exchange this two. Then the sum, sum over x2 becomes finite, which can be, uh, and uh, <coughs> so there's no dependence on x2, for the right for this summand. So this sum can be taken easily with the result given as x2, x, I'm sorry, x, sorry, it's y2, right? y2 minus uh, x1. On the other hand, so, So this determinant can be also calculated a little bit. Now, now so, so here, the function f1 and y2 appears, but maybe it is a bit easier to think about x1 and x2. So for this case, again, we use another recursion formula for the function f. So maybe f minus 1 can be written as a difference of f F0. And the same thing for this F minus 1. Now you see that uh, this part and this part is the same. So they can be, uh, so this can be omitted. The same thing for this place. Now we have the 2 by 2 determinant which, and whose matrix element is only written in terms of F0. And F0 is the case where this is 0, and uh, this is simply given by... F0 corresponds to one particle tasset. So this is simply given by this Poisson distribution. And then you can just put it inside this determinant and do a little bit of calculation. One. Yeah, this one also it shows some yeah recur recursive yeah identity for this function. So this because this has a nice structure in terms of x and n, so this has very nice properties, recursive properties and so on. So this is a particular case. F n can be written as a difference of f n minus one two times of f mi n minus one. F n can be written as a difference of f n n minus one. So this is, uh, so sorry, the, the opposite, yeah, sorry. F, 
if the n can be written as a difference with n plus one. Anyway, yeah, this is also written down in the notes. But, uh, you can check the details. But anyway, by using this type, type of calculation, then we can actually calculate this determinant. From here, you get uh, y2 minus x1. And here we also we also we had x y two minus x one. So now we have kind of difference of y minus x one squared. And if we now rewrite y two as x two, then we have x two minus x one squared. And then if we rewrite this a little bit, uh, symmetrize and shift by one, then we arrive at uh, this formula for the special case of n equal to. You, you can check more details in the notes, but uh, yeah, anyway, this is the direction from the transition probability to arrive at uh, this kind of random matrix type exp expression. So what do you think? Very mysterious calculation, I think. But anyways, this is a kind of calculation we, we first did. I first did with Nagao. So how to say? So this was the uh, result in 1997. And the Johansson's result was in 2000. So when I saw, so I, I knew this shift formula almost from the beginning, basically. And the later, after three years or so, Johansson's result came out. So I was very curious how one can re re uh, recover the Johansson's result by using his formula, right? And then we noticed that this kind of manipulation gives us a and re-derivation his results, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so at this point, this is just a kind of mysterious calculation. Now we, now we can understand this calculation in a kind of more transparent way. Because uh, now, let's say, at this point, so this can be considered as a, also determinant, right? At least for the case of n equal to So this can be written as one, one. So in fact, uh, uh, this is inside the sum, but in fact, it, it has turned out that. Uh, it is useful to consider this object. By changing slightly the name of the variables, we can consider object like this. Now we have three variables, x11, x21, and x22. And it also depends on t. And t depends, dependence appears only for this part of determinant. Here we don't have any t dependence. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Then one can check that uh, this is the, this is related to some Markov dynamics on kind of three particles, right? And with the condition that <coughs> and uh, from this formula, one can even check. So I, 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 I do not explain the details, but uh, one can check that uh, this is basically doing just a single particle 
or some random org, like TASIP. And this is also, the, so there, all, of, all three particles basically do totally asymmetric random work in continuous time. But uh, there is a condition that uh, this cannot overtake this. So there is a, there is a kind of exclusion condition. On this side, we can see that, uh, in fact, uh, this, this, is, this has a stronger opinion, so that if this moves, this has to, this has to move, e, move too. So this, this has to follow this, right? Otherwise, this is free. So with this condition, this, this does uh, all three particles to uh, usual totally estimate continuous time random walk. So this is, based, in fact, exactly the same dynamics as what uh, New explained yesterday, if you remember. Yeah, this is really actually the same. So, so this was the original equation I did with Nagao for re reproducing the results by Johansson, basically. But uh, later it has turned out that it's related to the dynamics on this kind of triangular array. And the, in fact, uh, so that calculation was done only for n equal two case, but we can do basically the same calculation for general n, and then, of course, we can also consider general n structures, three, one, three, two, and so on, and then we we can consider Markov dynamics on this triangular array, and. Uh, <coughs> Maybe we can do a slight shift of these variables in this way. Then the measure on this triangular array can be written in the form as follows. Here, yes. mm. <clears throat> so for, for the case of general n, with this shift, uh, we, we now use the variables lambda ij, then the measure appearing here can be written in the form of a product of s function, which is well known as the Schuer function, right? So in other words, in other words so, so the, uh, I explained a little bit about Schuer function on short tree, but uh, there's a well-known function known as the Schuer function, and uh, by using this, we consider a measure on the set of partitions, lambda one, blah, 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 lambda n, uh, which is given as a product of Schuer function in this way, and some function here. So this, S, I, I, so this is almost like Schuer function. In fact, this can be considered as a, kind of generalization of Fisher function, but uh, in our context now, so this part corresponds to this part, right? So anyway, so this part is really the usual Fisher function, and come, next comes some determinant, uh, which only dep depends on Sn. Yeah? Yeah, you so how to say? Mm, historically, I'd say, um, after the Johansson's work in 2000, some people already noticed the connection to kind of free fermion random matrix theory, right? And then one picture is that uh, if we consider this kind of triangular array, uh, one can see some connection better. And then I, yeah, I noticed that, in fact, the calculation I showed over there is in fact very much related to yeah, this picture too. And uh, yeah, 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 I started from here and I wanted to kind of yeah, see, uh, to explain how this kind of object appears from, the, from, that, from that aspect. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so with this shift of variables, now the condition can be written rather compactly, in a compact manner. Uh, 
All lambda ij are natural numbers. And we, so the set of natural numbers satisfying this condition and which can be represented in this kind of triangular array corresponding to these inequalities. So this is called Gelfand settling pattern. And the space of these Gelfand settling patterns is usually called Gelfand settling cone. But basically, they are yeah, the same object. Okay. Uh, what is the Schur function? Yeah, today, unfortunately, I don't think I have time to explain the details of a Schur function. But uh, this is already written in appendix of the notes, so you can take a look at it for some <coughs> properties. But maybe I mention a little bit. First, so the, now we are using notation lambda. So this is related to the fact that now this story is related to the partition lambda. So this is a set of n small n natural numbers, which can be represented as young diagram like this. And so and the, they are, uh, uh, yeah. They satisfy weakly decreasing condition. And, uh, um, yeah. The sugar function labeled by this partition lambda. Can be defined as a sum of a f one settling pattern, but uh, here, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is not a good definition. But anyway, yeah, sorry. Maybe I don't keep the definition. <laughs> there are some several definitions for the Schur function, which I want to omit for this lecture to save time. And, uh, but anyways, so actually, there are only a few properties we use for our purpose of this Schur function. So for example, one important property of the Schur function is that, yeah, x means x1. So let's consider, Schur function can be defined for arbitrary number of variables. Now we consider the case with n variables for one Schur function. maybe m variable Schur function for, for the right one. In this case, there is a well-known formula known as a Cauchy identity, which give, uh, gives us the very simple product formula for the sum of all partitions. This is often denoted as pi of x, y. Okay. So because we know explicitly the sum of a lambda, one can consider a measure. On the set of partitions in this form. Right. Now here, and z is just a... Uh, one over pi, right? And this is called a Schur measure. <clears throat> uh, 
There's another property. Yeah, so this is the sure function for a given single partition. But there's a generalization of sure function called skew sure function. Which is in this way. Now, when we have two partitions, lambda and mu, which satisfy some inclusion condition, this is called skew sure function. Then, this becomes, if we take this specific sum for this particular product of the sure function and the skew sure function, this gives us the, another sure function with more variables. So maybe, in, in a sense, we, one can add the variables of sure function by considering this sum. Right? So now if you look at this play, this, uh, this place, this, this part of this measure, then you see that the, the structure is exactly fit, with that, is fitting to that sum. So this means that, uh, so now we are considering some measure, which is a kind of generalization of this sure measure. Now we consider a lot of sure functions and the skew sure function in this way. But uh, one can consider taking some of, of, of a lambda one for us, for example. Then by using that formula, from here we get for this part, we get S lambda 2, 1, 1, right? And then if we, so now there's a, another, the next factor, S 3 over 2, S lambda 3 over lambda 2, then, then maybe we can take a sum over lambda 2, to get lambda three with three variables now, and we can continue this, this n times. Then after doing this, what we get is S lambda, yeah, so, so for the whole part, what we get is S lambda n of one. Not skew, the usual regular skew, sure function with n variables all variables are set to one, right? In fact, this is basically the same as this sure measure here. And uh, this one, which is, this is a generalization of this sure measure, this measure on Gelfan Zetrin pattern, so this is called sure process. And uh, what, we are, what, what I'm explaining here is that if we take a sum if we consider kind of marginal, so the sum corresponds to take sum over this, this row and this row and so on. Yeah, so this can be considered as lambda one, partition lambda one. This part can be considered as partition lambda two and so on. So the first sum corresponds to take a sum of, over this. The second sum corresponds to the sum over this and so on. So if we do up to n minus one level, then yeah, sorry, so before that, so the whole, the measure for the whole gelfand tetrin patterns given by this sure process. And this sum corresponds to take a sum over this. Then the remaining thing is that we consider now marginal measure on the top row, which is parameterized by usual uh, single param partition lambda n. And this measure is written as a product of two kind of sure functions on lambda n, this one times this one. And this is, has a, basically the same structure as this. So, which is known as a sure measure. So now, the point is that, <coughs> yeah, if we consider, yeah, first we can consider a measure on the whole gf and z twin cone. And if we focus on the top row, we have a sure measure here. And uh, another way of looking at things is to focus on this line. And uh, if you recall, for this case, 
This part corresponds to TASF particles. Instead of taking some over this part, if we consider marginal dynamics in this part, this we can study dynamics for TASEF. So suppose we originally we are interested in TASEF dynamics, which is related to this part. Maybe, for, for example, uh, the transition probability can be written as determinant. But this is, seems rather difficult to treat, right? Uh, maybe we can enlarge the TASEF dynamics to enlarge the dynamics on whole scale from set and cone. And then maybe, and we are basically interested in nth particle dynamics, probability distribution of particle, uh, probability distribution of the position of nth particle, for example, which is basically related to this object. Then instead of studying this part itself, maybe we can consider this part. And then the measure on this top row is now described by this sure measure, and this is easier to treat. Because another formula for the sure function for the Jacobi through the identity There is a formula which allows us to rewrite the sure function, S lambda of x, as a single determinant. Then, it means that uh, the sure measure here can be written as a product of two determinants. And if you remember, yesterday I stressed that uh, GUE, Gaussian Unitary Ensemble, is, is rather easy to treat because for the eigenvalues, we have a measure in the form of a product of two determinants, right? So this Van der Monte squared structure, this is very, very important for applying the usual techniques for random matter theory. And uh, this sure measure has exactly the same structure. The measure on partition lambda can be written as a product of two determinants due to this Jacobi 3D formula. So then, we can simply apply the usual standard procedure of random matrix theory to study, for example, the distribution of this particle, which is basically related to the current for KSF. And then, if we write down actually the formula, then this gives us the this kind of formula, or Laguerre ensemble unitary formula by Johansson and so on, then one can do yeah, asymptotics as well. Anyway. Uh, it's exactly the time. Yes, I wanted to go to the next step, but uh, for the moment, maybe, uh, maybe I, I get some questions, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. I, I, I think I want to do it. But um, this is a kind of, uh, this is really a point to stop a little bit, so, yeah. Hmm? Yeah? Oh, I don't think, so. oh, yeah, the question, if I understand well. So, so, so this is TASEF, so what I showed you from yesterday and today, is that uh, we can apply the beta answers to this line. But is there a possibility that one can apply kind of beta answers to the whole k tethering object, right? I don't think it's possible, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Basically, this is, beta answers works only for one dimensional many body system. Yeah. Yes? Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for mentioning it. I, I should have mentioned it here, but I forgot. So, yeah. so, so in this lecture, we, fo we, we just basically focus on the step-initial condition, which is the simplest, technically. 
But、uh, as you, as Nikos noticed, my, our calculation here does not really depend on yj, so the initial position of particles. So this was a very, very important、uh, point, in fact, in this analysis. So originally we had somehow yj here, right? Yeah, yeah. Transition probability formula, and we could keep that yj dependence, initial, con initial configuration dependence in this formula, and、uh, basically the same calculation works. But at some point,、uh, we have to consider somewhat a different strategy because,、uh, in this case of step initial condition, we really see this v a n d e r m o n t squared, and then we know how to handle it by using orthogonal polynomials and so on. But for the gen general, general yj's, Initial configuration, we still have, I'll say, for general. Maybe we have v a n d e r m o n t times we get structure like this. First, usual v a n d e r m o n t determinant, and the second determinant comes from here. So, this is still determinant, but depends on yj and the matrix element written in terms of this f, f function in the transition probability. Now, to apply the kind of usual techniques from random matrix theory, we have to do some kind of orthogonalization at this point. But、uh, for some specific choice of yj's, for example, of course,、uh, one can do this orthogonalization for this step case, but other important c a s e Important initial conditions for which one could do this orthogonalization procedure is the so called alternate initial condition, in which particles are put on every other side, only on even sides, say. And in, for this particular example of initial condition, one can also do some orthogonalization by considering appropriate linear combination of this part. Then, yeah, one can proceed to see it. Then, for example, For this particular case, we get GOE trace with this situation. And in fact, yeah, thank you for mentioning this. So next, next week, so Lemonik、uh, will show the universality aspect of the t a s e f and so on, I think. And、uh, basically, what they use is this, this formula, because this works for general y j s On the other hand, the original work by Johansson strongly depends on very special initial c o n d i t i o n It works for step initial, condition, step initial condition. One can also introduce some parameters. This is also related to a stationary case. But、uh, originally, it, it looks very, very difficult to study this alternating case. But、uh, with, with these yeah, techniques, it's rather straightforward to do that.、Yeah. Thank you for mentioning.